Magavan and folks. Today we have the integral from 0 to infinity of sine of tangent x times cosine x over x dx. Why, you may ask? Well, trig functions are awesome, but nested trig integrals are even better. So that's why you see the sine of tangent x instead of something boring like sine x times tangent x or whatever. But how on earth are we to approach this? Well, if I had something like a sine x over x term, that would have been quite neat because I could apply a certain integral formula. Oh wait, I can have something like sine x over x because I can write this as integral 0 to infinity. 1 over x times sine of tangent x times cosine x over sine x. And to balance things out, I have a sine x up top here. Terribly sorry about that. Terribly sorry about that once again. Okay, cool. So this looks like something on which I can apply Lobachevsky's integral formula. Of course, this is the cotangent function. What is wrong with my drawing, my box drawing today? So this is the cotangent of x. And I was talking about Lobachevsky's integral formula. That is to say, a formula stating that if you have the integral from 0 to infinity of sine x over x times f of x dx, where f is such that it satisfies two criteria. That is, f of x is even and f of x is pi periodic. So that means f of x plus or minus k times pi, where k is some non-negative integer, or in fact, I could just write this as k times pi and let k be any integer. This thing is supposed to equal f of x. Now let's see if both criteria are satisfied for the case of our function, that is to say f of x equals sine of tangent x times the cotangent of x. Now, when you replace x by negative x, then we have f of minus x equal to sine of tangent of minus x. And tangent is an odd function, so you have minus tangent x over here. And sine itself is an odd function, so you, so you can take the sine outside. You can take the negative sine outside, that is, there's already a sine outside. And cotangent, which is the reciprocal of tangent, is also an odd function. So that means you get f of x on replacing x by negative x. In other words, f of x is indeed even. And we know that tangent and hence cotangent are both pi periodic. So that means both criteria for applying the formula are satisfied. And this formula states that the integral is equal to the integral from 0 to pi over 2 now of f of x dx. So all of this implies that the target integral i is now the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of sine of tangent x times cotangent x dx. Okay, cool. So what exactly can we do now? Well, one option would be to let tangent x equal u, which implies that x here equals arctangent u. And this further implies that dx here equals du over 1 plus u squared. And of course, as x approaches pi over 2, we have u approaching infinity. And as x approaches 0, we have u approaching 0 as well. So our target integral transforms into the integral from 0 to infinity again of sine of u and cotangent of x would be 1 over u. And we have this du over 1 plus u squared term. The new structure looks perfect for applying Feynman's trick of differentiating under the integral sign. And speaking of Feynman's trick and integrals in general, my friend Miguel Santiago, you may know him as the vegan math guy on Instagram. He's released a new book called Book of Marvelous Integrals. It is a fantastic piece of mathematic literature, which is a fancy way of saying, it got awesome integrals, bro. Check it out, yo. And yeah, it is a great book. He makes great content in general. So do drop him a follow and do check out that book. Anyway, so what exactly was I up to? Oh yeah, I was going to define the integral function i of some parameter alpha as the integral from zero to infinity of sine of alpha x, where I'm replacing the dummy variable u by x again, over x times 1 plus x squared dx. 
And the rationale for that is if I differentiate sine of alpha x with respect to alpha, partially that is, I'll get an x term outside which should cancel out with the x term in the denominator. So this implies that I prime of alpha, terribly sorry about that, which is the integral from zero to infinity of the partial derivative with respect to alpha of sine of alpha x over x times one plus x squared dx equals the integral from zero to infinity of x times cosine alpha x over x times one plus x squared dx. The x's cancel out and now we're left with a familiar looking integral. I believe we can solve this using differentiation under the integral sign again, or why not make this some kind of epic collaboration? One of my best friends, Myers, actually sent me a solution of the Dirichlet integral where he first applied, I think he first applied contour integration and then Feynman's trick, but we're going to do the opposite. So we're going to apply, we've just applied Feynman's trick, but now for some contour integration. So we'll define our complex valued function f of z as e to the negative i alpha z over 1 plus z squared. The rationale behind that being the real part of e to the negative i alpha z is in fact cosine of negative alpha z and cosine is an even function so it doesn't care about the negative sign and that returns the numerator. Well, the numerator with a z in place of x, but it'll do, it will suffice. So that's our complex valued function f of z, and we'll define the semicircular contour of radius r, so I'll mark out negative and positive r here, and this would be the diameter, terribly sorry about that, not very good at drawing on this thing, not very good at drawing in general anyway, but I think that's what every math and science teacher always says. So that's the diameter of the circle, and this is the circumference. So I'll call the semicircular arc uppercase gamma, and I'll call the entire contour C. And we notice that it encloses only one pole of the function. That is to say, the poles of the function are z equal to plus and minus i, but we'll only concern ourselves with this pole z equal to i in the upper half of the complex plane. So the integral over the closed contour C of e to the i alpha z, rather, wait, that should be e to the negative something, and I didn't like the way I wrote out the integral sign over there. I normally write it out that way, but I don't know, perhaps my OCD is kicking in. Anyway, so the integral over the closed contour C of our function is supposed to equal 2 pi i times the sum of residues of the function, and there is only one residue, so I don't need the summation operator. So 2 pi i times the residue of e to the negative i alpha z over 1 plus z squared at z equal to i. Now z equals to i is a simple pole, so calculating it is quite straightforward. I just need the limit as z approaches i of z minus i times e to the negative i alpha z over 1 plus z squared is factored out as z plus i times z minus i. So the z minus i terms cancel out, and we let z approach i, giving us for the limit e to the negative i squared alpha, which is, of course, e to the alpha. Okay, cool. Over. You know what? I never really needed the negative sign in the first place. Why am I even bothering? Yeah, it's not even necessary. And let me just clean this up a little bit. Not to say bring it closer in. I really don't have any utility for the negative sign. I'm pretty sure some of you may have echoed that sentiment already in the comments. Or maybe some of you were confused as to why does he need a negative sign with a complex exponential in the first place. Anyway, with the i squared term, you have a negative alpha up top. And downstairs, you have 2i, which cancels out quite nicely. So that means the integral over the closed contour c equals pi times e to the minus alpha, which does look interesting, but we're interested in the integral from zero to infinity of cosine of alpha x, and that is not exactly a big deal, 
because we can break down the integral over c into two different integrals. That is to say, one integral over the diameter from negative to positive r, and one integral over the semicircular arc. And of course, we are interested in the limiting case of r going to infinity. So this implies that the integral from negative to positive r plus the integral over gamma equals pi times e to the negative alpha. And now to evaluate the two cases separately. So for the case of the limit as r goes to infinity of the integral from negative r to positive r, we have the integral from negative to positive infinity of e to the i alpha x, because we can parameterize z by x, that is to say the real part, over 1 plus x squared dx. And this is cool because this gives us the integral from negative to positive infinity of cosine alpha x over 1 plus x squared dx plus i times the integral from negative to positive infinity of sine of alpha x over 1 plus x squared dx. And the good news about this bad boy is that it is the integral of an even function over a symmetric interval, so it converges to zero. Thus, the limit as r goes to infinity of the integral from negative to positive r is in fact equal to the integral from negative to positive infinity of cosine alpha x over 1 plus x squared dx, and we're integrating an even function over a symmetric interval this time, so we can write this as twice the integral from 0 to infinity of cosine alpha x over 1 plus x squared, and of course I am known for often omitting the dx terms. Uh, there should be a timestamp for that. I'm trying to select all of this, and I am successful. So that is in fact twice of i prime of alpha, which is exactly what we're looking for. But we also have another term here. We have the limit as r goes to infinity of the integral over the semicircle gamma of e to the i alpha z over 1 plus z squared dz. Now, how exactly can we parameterize the semicircular arc? Well, we're traversing this bad boy in the counterclockwise sense. So for any vector z on this circle, we have z equal to r times e to the i theta, where theta is bound between pi and 0. So that's our parameterization. So we'll write this as the limit, terribly sorry about that, as r goes to infinity of the integral from 0 to pi of e to the i alpha r e to the i theta over 1 plus r squared e to the 2i theta. And of course, if z equals r times e to the i theta, this implies on differentiation that dz equals i r e to the i theta d theta. So that's exactly what I'm going to write down here. Okay, cool. And I could expand the exponential up top. I mean, I have e to the i alpha r times, by Euler's formula, cosine theta plus i times sine theta. So that gives me e to the i alpha r cosine theta. Terribly sorry about that. Uh, two i's make an i squared, and that's negative one. So I have alpha r sine theta, which I could decompose as e to the negative alpha r sine theta times e to the i alpha r sine theta. So another complex exponential term here as well. But what am I going to do with all this information, especially given that I'm interested in r going to infinity? Well, we're going to apply everyone's favorite lemma, that is the ML estimate. Or maybe it's everyone's second favorite lemma behind Jordan's lemma. I'm not sure. I like applying the ML estimates slightly better. So we know that the absolute value of the integral over a contour gamma of a function f is less than or equal to the integral over the same contour gamma of the absolute value of that very same function. So if I'm considering the absolute value of the integral over gamma, gamma being the semicircular arc, and f being our function, I'm saying that this is less than or equal to the integral from 0 to pi 
of the absolute value of our function, which is quite a lot of junk. So that is, of course, up top, we have e to the negative alpha r sine theta. This is a positive real number. No need for the absolute value sign over there. The absolute value of e to the i times some real number is always going to be 1, so I'm going to skip that out. Uh, same goes for the exponential function over here. Absolute value of i is also equal to 1, so I just have an r term left. And I'm left with 1 plus r squared times e to the 2i theta in the absolute value d theta. Now, 1 over absolute value 1 plus r squared e to the 2i theta is going to be less than or equal to 1 over r squared minus 1. So this implies that the absolute value of the integral over gamma of f is less than or equal to the integral from 0 to pi of e to the negative alpha r sine theta times r over r squared minus 1 d theta. And I could just factor out an r squared term from the denominator. So I have r squared, 1 minus 1 over r squared, some cancellation over there. So I have this thing equal to 1 over r times the integral from 0 to pi of e to the negative alpha r sine theta over 1 minus 1 over r squared d theta. And I could have taken the... 1 minus 1 over r squared term outside of the integral as well. It doesn't matter because I'm interested in the limit as r goes to infinity and the right-hand side approaches 0 as r tends to infinity. So this implies that the limit as r goes to infinity of the absolute value of the integral over gamma of f is equal to 0. But wait, the only complex number with an absolute value of 0 is 0 itself. So this implies that the limit of r, that the limit as r goes to infinity of the integral over gamma of f is indeed equal to 0. And that leaves behind the result that our 2 pi i times the sum of residue terms, that is pi times e to the negative alpha, equals twice of i prime of alpha. In other words, we have i prime of alpha simply equal to pi over 2 times e to the negative alpha. And now to recover back the integral function. So we'll integrate this thing with respect to alpha. And that yields on the left-hand side i of alpha. And on the right, we have negative pi over 2 times e to the negative alpha plus some constant of integration c. And to determine that, recall that i of alpha was defined as the integral from 0 to infinity of sine of alpha x over x times 1 plus x squared dx. And if I plug in alpha equal to 0, the numerator being sine of 0 collapses to 0, and hence the integral collapses to 0, meaning that on plugging in alpha equal to 0, for our equation up top, we get 0 equal to negative pi over 2 plus c, which of course implies that c here is just pi over 2, and that means we could factor a pi over 2 from the right-hand side and get i of alpha equal to pi over 2 times 1 minus e to the negative alpha. Now, what exactly was the target case? Oh yeah, the target case was just alpha equal to 1. So this implies that the target integral i, that is to say the integral from 0 to infinity of sine of tangent x times cosine x over x dx equals a very nice looking result involving our two favorite transcendentals. That is to say pi over 2 times 1 minus 1 over e, or I could tidy this up and write this as pi times e minus 1 over 2e. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Do drop me a follow on Instagram as well. Thank you. See you next time.